That's why it burns. Huh. Is that what tear gas is? Sulfuric acid, basically? What is it? Tear gas? No, no, tear gas is not sulfuric acid. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Nope. Yeah, something altogether different. Okay. It'll pull the moisture out. And you know the difference between a banjo and an onion? Tear gas? <laughs> a, few, a few strings and some music. <laughs> <laughs> what? What could this possibly be? This is awesome. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on. Are you yes. ready for the answer? Yes. Nobody cries when you cut up a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll, have, I'll have to give my uncle that. I'm having, I'm having dinner with my uncle tomorrow. He'll think See, I used that. to play five-string banjo, so that's my banjo. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've well, never played an instrument in here. That's oh. I don't. Okay. You haven't in a while. Uh, I'd love to see that. No, I played harmonica in two, two big different bands for me. Mm -hmm. Great bands. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got sidetracked there. I guess we're ready for Miss Andrea from Knoxville, Tennessee. Come in here today and preach to us. <laughs> All right. And if she's a Baptist, she'll go. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> oh gosh! Ha! That's awesome. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> He's making fun of that. I have a friend though, my friend Josh, who came. We were talking a couple of days ago, and he was he was raised Pentecostal Church of God, where they pitch babies out of the balcony and have full on experiences. Just kidding. I've never. I don't. I don't get that reference, but kids, that's okay. And I was like, I'm a Baptist. He's like, no, you're Baptistical. So that's we're all right. Baptistical. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. We don't do that. We've well, already had the sweet. Just go ahead. Well, I mean, I don't want it. To, this, I don't think you want me to ramble on like I did with Joel. So, um. I she does not need a mic. No, she's our no. <laughs> no. I hate my beard. Your uh, let's see. See. Oh, thank you. There's your picture behind you. Hmm. That is a picture that one of the few Christian sites on Facebook that I actually trust called Christian Cafe, and it's a manger that would have been used during the time of Christ. That's what an actual manger looked like. It was actually found in Israel. And the manger ties in to what I'm going to talk about. And so do your candy canes. Because we're going to talk about shepherds. Because originally, the plan was for me to talk about Amos. And thankfully, after a very good conversation, um, me and a very wise woman, mostly the wise woman, less than me, decided it would probably be better to table a full-on discussion of Amos. But Amos, I'm going to touch just a little bit on Amos. Amos was a prophet, and Amos was a shepherd. And when God called Amos, he was just minding his business, going about his day in a little teeny tiny town called Tekoa, which is probably, I mean, compared to Tekoa, Nazareth probably looked like the big city. <coughs> um, because T Tekoa was a little teeny tiny backwater. I was trying to think about what, like, a so I could wrap my mind about around what Tacoa would look like. I think Tacoa would probably be kind of like Philadelphia in Loudoun County. Like you can spend five minutes dri driving through it, and if you blink, you'll miss it literally from end to end. There's like one Dollar General, there's a library, and there's a public school, and mostly houses. And if you blink, you miss it. So I think to me that's kind of what Tacoa was, but he was a shepherd. And he also gathered sycamore fruit, different from the sycamore trees. There were sycamore shrubs that 
bore fruit, and he was just out going about his day, gathering, taking care of his sheep, gathering his sycamore. And the Lord came to him and spoke to him and said, I want you to go to the northern kingdom, and I want you to preach, and I want you to prophesy. So Amos went, and he prophesied. And when I started thinking about Christmas today, even though we all know, like Jack said earlier, today is not the day of Jesus' birth. When you think about what Jesus' birth means, the thing that the Lord kept speaking into my heart was the least of these. And of all the people that God could have delivered the good news of Jesus' birth to, the shepherds truly were the least. Mm -hmm. They were the lowest part of acceptable Jewish society. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I may be wrong. I mean, they weren't with the harlots and the tax collectors and the thieves, but as far as the acceptable portions of society, shepherds were the very bottom. And I think that's interesting because shepherds figure very prominently in the work of God, in the foundations and the origins of the Bible, the origins of the nation of Israel. It's all tied in to shepherds. Just consider the following. Genesis 4, 1 through 8, you have the introduction of Cain and Abel. Abel was the first shepherd in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because it says mm -hmm. that in a, at an appointed time, Abel took the first of his flock mm -hmm. and offered so it as a sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. That's so, good. so he was the first shepherd. Mm -hmm. So going back to the beginning, going back to Eden, going back to Adam and Eve, there you have the shepherds. Out of that, then you have Abraham. Abraham was a shepherd. Abraham had other things besides. He had camels and donkeys and cattle and goats, but he had sheep too. Lot had sheep. He was a shepherd. That's when they separated because the land could not contain both of them having their flocks and their herds together, so that's when they split. From Abraham, you have Isaac. Isaac inherited all that was Abraham's. He was a shepherd. When Jacob left Rebekah and Isaac after he had tricked and deceived his father and tricked and deceived his brother, I hold more of the fact that he deceived his father more than Esau. It was wrong what he did to Esau, but I really feel like what he did to Isaac, it, it, that's always bothered me. But when Jacob comes into the land of Laban, his uncle, the first person he sees is Rachel. Rachel was a shepherdess. Rachel was in the field tending to her father's sheep. He saw her. He went up to her. He fell in love. He kissed her right there. When then you fast forward a few years after Joseph has been sold into slavery <clears throat> and is in Egypt and his brothers, sorry, had <clears throat> a piece of candy sticking to my tooth. He and his brothers come together. <clears throat> they have, he forgives them and they have healing and they come together once again as a family. When Joseph goes before Pharaoh to introduce his family, he takes five of his brothers, and he takes his father. And when Joseph and his brothers and Jacob all go before Pharaoh, he introduces his brothers as shepherds. And Pharaoh even asks, asks them, I think specifically just to kind of gauge the family dynamic, what their profession is. They're shepherds. That's how they answer because of that, excuse me, because of that, Pharaoh decides to give them the best of the land in Egypt, Goshen, 
to tend to their flocks, their herds, and then to also tend to Pharaoh's herds and flocks, mostly his herds. Hmm. So that's how you get Israel, the nation Israel, into Egypt. Fast forward a few more years. Moses, the adopted son of the daughter of Pharaoh, is raised in Pharaoh's court, lap of luxury, a prince. He's raised in a land that has no less than three million gods. And when he, his anger is kindled against an Egyptian who's beating a Hebrew slave, he murders him, and he's driven into the wilderness for 40 years. And while he's in the wilderness, he marries Zipporah. And Zipporah is the daughter of Jethro, and Jethro was a shepherd. And when Moses saw the burning bush, he was out in the wilderness tending his sheep, tending the flocks of Jethro. Fast forward even more, then you have David, the greatest king, the golden age, the shepherd king, the little boy. And in all of these instances, you see the least, God take the least and make it into the best, I think. Because, mm -hmm. especially in the instance of David, because David was the runt of the family. He was the son that probably his father liked the least. Because when Samuel came to Bethlehem and visited the house of Jesse and said, I'm going to anoint one of your sons king of Israel, Samuel had to ask, after all the other sons were presented, do you have any more sons? Well, yeah, I have one son, David, but he's out in the, he's out in the fields. He's tending my few sheep. You don't want him. So they bring David in, and David is anointed king of Israel. The least, the littlest. And you think about you think about what all is entailed to be a shepherd, and then obviously you move forward a few more, I don't know, a few centuries. We'll, we'll just say that, a few centuries. Then you have Amos. Everything that a shepherd does is is so central to Israel in every way. It's central to their livelihoods. It's central to their eating. It's central to the religion. Because when God takes his people out of Egypt, he gives them, in Exodus 12, he gives them the requirements for the Passover land. And then later in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, when he establishes the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and lays down the law, he gives very specific requirements for those sacrifices. And the way these, she these sheep are cared for, the way they're fed, the way that everything about how these sheep are treated is very much dependent upon whether or not a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, can be offered because you can have a tabernacle stocked with olive oil and frankincense and myrrh and all of the incense and you can have all the priests that you want garbed, washed, ready to go. But if you don't have any lambs that meet that requirement, there's no, there's no purpose. There's, there's no reason to be there. And I think it's interesting that of all the professions, you would think that the shepherd would be the one that, you know, there would at least be some national appreciation or acceptance for, but by the time of Jesus, there really isn't. There really isn't. They're, they are the least. And isn't it interesting that Jesus, God, Son of God, God's perfect only begotten son lays down the splendor and glory of heaven and his full divinity not not you know what i mean i mean the full radiance and beauty and glory of his divinity and 
condescends to allow himself to come to earth to be born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. And he compares himself to a shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd. John 12, John 10. He talks about the good shepherd. Isaiah 53, when I, the chapter where he describes Jesus' death, one of the things that's used to describe how Jesus dies, he stood as a lamb being led to the slaughter, and he opened not his mouth as a wow. sheep being taken to the shear. Wow. Um, shepherds are so important, but like most important things, they're easily they're easily looked over and they're easily easily forgotten. And so I want to take the time to read the most famous of all the Christmas accounts of Jesus. And the ones with the shepherds, I want to go to Luke 2. If I can turn there. There we go. And we're going to start in verse 8. And this is the King James. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Pay close attention to what I'm about to say. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Don't forget that. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And I think when they stood there and they said that, I think they probably put, when they were talking to each other, which the Lord hath made known unto us. He didn't, he didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't announce this in the court of Herod the Great. He didn't visit the house of the, the high priest. He took, he went to the field in Bethlehem and told a group of tired, stinky shepherds, because sheep stink, from what I understand. I've, 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 I've been around cows, and I, I know that in a group of cows, but, but I've heard that sheep are particularly fragrant. <laughs> he announced it to them, and it came to well, wait a minute. Lord hath made known unto us, and they came with haste. They didn't stand around to wait and say, "Well, now I don't know. Should we go to the? Maybe we maybe we need to pray. Maybe we need to ask for a sign. Maybe we need to throw down some wool, like Gideon did." And, and ask God to give us, you know, let us know if this is real. No, they went with haste. Mm -hmm. They were so happy and they were so excited. That was probably the most excitement those men would have ever had in their life. That was the biggest thing. Nothing before or since that encounter, I guarantee you, that was the highlight of their life. That was the thing that for the rest of their lives they would talk about. They would tell their wives, they would tell their kids. If they lived long enough, they would tell their grandkids. That was their, that was their moment with Jesus. And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all that they had heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And all that heard it, excuse me, all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Well, they wondered because it was a group of shepherds. It wasn't a delegation of priests. It wasn't, you know, a, a rabbi. 
from a local synagogue. It was a group of shepherds. Hmm. How interesting. And I think it's interesting, not only does Jesus call himself the good shepherd, you have in Luke 15, you have the parable of the lost sheep. One of three parables about the lost things. You have the sheep, the lost sheep first, then you have the, the lost coins, and then you have the prodigal son. You also have, after Jesus has, re has been resurrected in John 21, and is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and has cooked the breakfast for he and his disciples, he and Peter have a little stroll along the shore and they have a little conversation. And he asks Peter three times, Do you love me? And each time that Peter says he loves him, it's interesting though, Jesus asks him, Do you agape me? And two times, and Peter's response all three times is, Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. Which is brotherly love. Yes, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me sacrificially, the way I love you? And the third time, Jesus brings his response down to Peter. He asks, Do you phileo me? Yes, I phileo you. And each time he says that, he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, take care of my flock. He's basically taking Peter off the, off the boat and taking the net out of his hands and is saying, here, you love me? I want you to take the staff of a shepherd. I want you to take the crook and I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to be a shepherd. And for me, 